Hi everyone, and this is, we're going to do this video on the evolution of medical treatment, and this one video that you're watching is part one. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hair Loss Show. Russell, good to have you again. Thank you very much, Vikram. Uh, in today's episode, I think we're going to do things a little bit differently than we normally do. We're really, uh, A, first of all, very grateful that you're here joining us. Uh, thank you again for watching. Uh, we normally are quite used to doing sort of these sort of short form content with little videos on, on separate topics, and we really sort of try and um, outline and highlight and summarize the key points on a variety of different uh, topics, be it medical or surgical. But today we're going to take a slightly different uh, tact on, on things because we want to do uh, a bit of a deeper dive into medical therapy. Uh, because I think we were having a chat off camera before we started. This is a really important topic. We get a lot of questions about it. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet, but really trying to help people understand you know, what they're taking, what it's doing, and really sort of sort of navigate the, the minefield because what is true, you know, uh, for one person is not necessarily true for the, the next person, and that could be uh, individual, it could be geographical uh, in nature. So there's a lot, a lot of things to, to talk about. So we really, I mean, I didn't even know what the, the, what we're going to talk, uh, call this topic, but it's about sort of, um, medical therapies. Uh, and it'll probably be a longer episode than what we normally are used to doing. And we'll probably split it up, but uh, yeah, we, we want to sort of take a, a deep dive into things. I think if I had to put it in an, you know, like, I like put it in a category. It's about the evolution of medical treatments with not just new ones, but with the ones that we already have had for a long time. So we've had uh, minoxidil in Australia for 36 years that's been available in uh, the US for a bit longer than that. So yep. these, that's a, not a new medicine. Uh, we've had finasteride for hair loss uh, in America since 1997. 1998 in Australia, that's not a new medicine. This is like 27 years ago. Yeah. So we're talking about, partly what we're talking about today are these two mainstays that have stood the test of time mm -hmm. to this day, still stand the test of time, but how there's an evolution in how they're being applied to the individual yes. patients. And I think that's important because, you know, and the two medications we're talking about are finasteride and, and minoxidil. Um, and it's very easy to, when the you know new shiny object uh, appears on the horizon, to you know all the focus to to go there. But at the at the same time, as you said, we keep coming back to these two uh, types of medications or two classes of medications because a they stood the test of the time and they've got you know results that have lasted yes. that amount of time. So where I really want to start the conversation mm -hmm. with our audience is describing what an approved medicine is versus the off-label use of mm -hmm. a medicine. So um, I don't want to just strategize it to every country, but if we start with the US, the Food and Drug Administration, yep. the FDA, they only have two approved treatments for male pattern hair loss. That is oral finasteride and topical 5% minoxidil. To this day, they are still the only two approved treatments so we, you know, we, people are talking about, well, what about topical finasteride, you know, oral finasteride, uh, topical minoxidil, uh, oral minoxidil, um, you know, you can do mesotherapy with, with all of these, we can, uh, all of these things, but fundamentally, there's really only two currently approved for hair loss. Now, what in does the approved US. mean? Well, what approved means is the FDA in America, yeah. the EMA, European Medicines Agency in Europe, uh, the British uh, uh, Health and Research Council in Australia, it's called the Therapeutic Goods Administration, yep. the TGA, they all have a role. And the role is to be presented with clinical data from Big Pharma who have done the trials on these medicines and they assess it for the quality of the research, the effectiveness of the treatment, just as importantly, the safety yeah. of the treatment. So those are the three criteria. They don't run the research, they analyze the research. Mm. So if something is approved, by the FDA, it's because a company has bought their research to them yes. and said, this is our data, do you agree that yeah. this is something that can be approved as a, a product for, the, for this purpose? So that's, that's what we should understand, what yeah. an approved product is. Off-label use of that product means that they haven't gone through the same regulatory agreements, 
and presented data for the different way of doing it. So you might present oral finasteride data, but you haven't presented topical finasteride yeah. data in the proper research. And why wouldn't you do that? Well, a number of reasons probably, but one is cost. Yes. It's phenomenally expensive to, first of all, develop the treatment, go through enough research. We're not talking about people being tested, uh, the, a medicine being tested on hundreds of patients. By the time it gets to the FDA or the TGA, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of patients by the time it gets to that uh, level. So it's a very expensive process. And even 10 years ago, people were saying it costs at least 100 million to run a drug through mm. the regulatory process. 100 million US, that's 10 years ago. So if you have finasteride orally, and uh, you you know you know it works. You know the company isn't going to go and spend another yeah. hundred and fifty million dollars on doing the topical version. So it's a, the cost is, is predominantly what it is. I it's not just because something we're using is off label doesn't mean it's not effective. Correct. Yeah. So this is where the next bit gets interesting. So for example, there are no manufactured by big pharma or credible pharma topical finasteride products in the world. So if people want to go from oral finasteride to topical finasteride, and we'll explain why there's an increasing trend yes. for that in a moment. The thing to remember is that, that you can't go to your normal pharmacy yes. and buy it over the counter yeah. with a script, right? It'll yes. still be a prescription, right? But you can't buy it. Somebody has to make it. Mm -hmm. And what's devolved in recent times is that a lot of the pharmacies themselves do it in-house. Yes. And that raises the next question raises the next question of quality control. Correct. And this is what we don't know because when we know it comes from big pharma and it's gone through the process. So for example, any drug that is allowed to be sold in a pharmacy in Australia has had to prove to the TGA in mm -hmm. Australia that the dosing level uh, that's written on the, the label is within 10% of what's claimed. Yes. So one milligram of finasteride has to be at least 0.9 but no more than 1.1 milligram. And the manufacturing facilities that make these medications are audited on a regular basis right. so, uh, so to make sure that they're maintain, maintaining quality control. There's a high degree of confidence yeah. that these products have been manufactured properly. Yes. So as an aside, I would urge our patient population that thinks buying medicine on the internet is a great idea, mm -hmm. is that you're bypassing this whole regulatory process of where was this manufactured? Is it in a proper manufacturing facility? Is there quality control in terms of the dosing? And, and we see this not just at that level, we see it at the prescribing level as well, because uh, you and I have both experiences, because I, we've talked to people about, and let's give an example of topical finasteride. You, you, you started with that, which is that I know of some practitioners goes, oh, look, I, you know, this pharmacy, we only go to this particular pharmacy to get our topical finasteride because we've seen great results with the way, with the, the preparation that they are making. Well, if it's made to the same concentration, uh, then every pharmacy should be making, you know, should be getting the same response with their product. But that's the problem when it's when it's devolved to, you know, individual, the quality control. They don't even pharmacy. use the same ingredients. Yeah necessarily, right, that is the stabilizers, for example, on there. So <clears throat> bottom line is when we're using off-label use of a product, it can be a com what we call a compounded pro mm -hmm. uh, a product, which means that it's been made in the pharmacy because it doesn't yes. exist. The other version of off-label is when you use a properly tested medicine like Jutasteride yeah. uh, for a non-approved use, which is hair loss. So Jutasteride to this day is only approved for treating people with non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate, prostate. but it is incredibly commonly and increasingly being used in treating hair loss. So this is a properly manufactured product, not a compounded mm -hmm. product, but being used for a purpose that hasn't been submitted to a regulatory agency for approval for that purpose. And again, probably because they don't want to spend the money. Yes. So that's more it. of a financial reason as opposed to you know, having, having the data associated with And you with can have that. more confidence that that's a in that circumstance, you can yeah. have a more confidence because it's available, that's a properly formulated product. Again, if you go through your own area, not necessarily through the internet. Yes. Um, so coming back to uh, lay, you know, on label, off label, you talked about the FDA, you know, the, European, the Europeans have a different uh, set of guidelines, isn't Yes, it? the only two approved treatments in Europe for uh, male pattern hair loss are uh, oral finasteride and 
hair transplantation. Yes, so that's, kind, that's of, really, yeah. that's kind of weird. Um, and also we should remember, because we're going to we're going to start talking about minoxidil in a second, Yes, that the data that is presented to the regulatory authorities and the way you did the trial is the way you're allowed to label the product. And I've been through this with our audience before. When I was one of the five doctors in Australia doing the original minoxidil topical trials in 1984-85, we were presented with a trial protocol that said one mil applied twice a day. And that's what we did. And that's yeah. the data that we submitted to the TGA and it got approved and in 1989 it came on the marketplace. And to this day, 36 mm -hmm. years later, it's still one mil twice a day. Yes. Even though we know <clears throat> that people with small areas of loss don't need a mil. Yes. People with large areas of <clears throat> loss may need more than a mil. Yeah. And even though we have no, the chemistry of the medicine tells us that it lasts at a significant level in the skin for 21 hours. So there, it is superfluous, yeah. really, from the chemistry of the medicine to use it twice a day. But we still see trials being reported yes. for using twice a day. Twice a day. And so it's, it's really important to, to understand that because just because something is on label or off label doesn't mean it is or isn't uh, effective. And that kind of leads us on to our next you know, point of discussion because...